button now. All right. Um, welcome and thank you everyone who decided to join today's webinar. Um, today we're talking about navigating hair pulling together, a support webinar. My name is Dr. Sofia Wenzler. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and so also the clinical lead here at TrickStop, um, the online therapy program that is bringing this webinar to you. And yeah, my presentation is going to be about 40, 45 minutes long. I want to encourage you to stick around until the end because there's going to be a Q&A section where you can ask any and all of your questions. Please, if you do have a question, you can post it in the Q&A section um, during my presentation or at the end, and then I will get to as many as of those questions as I can. And um, please don't raise your hand, just write your question down in the Q&A section. Okay, let's dive right into it. Um, <clears throat> so since support is such a broad um, and important topic, I'm actually kind of addressing three different um, groups of people today. First of all, when we're talking about sharing, I'm addressing those of you who are actually stu um, suffering from hair pulling. Um, and we're gonna talk about how you can open up to other people in order to get support. And then I'm gonna talk about two subgroups of, you know, the people who care for a loved one who suffers from hair pulling. The first one would be partners and friends and family. And the second one, because that one is a little bit more specific, is um, parents of children who pull their hair. Um, then we're going to conclude <laughs> all of the information and move on to the Q&A section. All right, hearing. Sharing about your hair pulling experience is such a sensitive and um, sometimes complicated topic for a lot of people. There are actually plenty of very understandable reasons why a lot of the people that I have met that suffer from hair pulling are hesitant um, about sharing their experience. Um, maybe you feel the same. Maybe you've all you, you feel self conscious about the pulling. Maybe you feel like it's this giant secret that you cannot share with everyone, anyone. Um, or maybe you feel like other people wouldn't understand you. Um, whatever it is, I understand those concerns. And um, if you are suffering from hair pulling, then think about it for a second. To get as much out of this webinar as possible, try to be practical and try to, you know, put your own experience into it. So think about how much you share about the hair pulling with who. And if you feel like you, there's people in your life that you don't share this experience with, then think about why, what are your concerns? And keep those concerns in the back of your mind as we move forward. Um, so since I'm a therapist, you will probably not be surprised to hear that I am very pro sharing. I think um, sharing is, very important for various reasons that we're going to go through, but um, one first and foremost that I want to explain to you. Um, so when we decide to keep a part of ourselves, a complete secret, then there is something very important and complex going on inside ourselves. On the surface, you know, what you notice are your concerns. You might think things like they won't understand, nobody can know, they will expect me to stop. What if they see my bold spots, stuff like that. But if you go a level deeper, then those concerns actually um, hint towards um, certain things that you yourself think about yourself. And so we all, you know, have this critical voice inside ourselves, um, no matter if we suffer from hair pulling or not. Um, this critical voice that, um, you know, puts us down, that makes us um, feel diff uh, different, that, you know, demands so much from ourselves. And um, when we when we have those concerns about other people, it actually says that this critical voice in ourselves, you know, tells us things like, you're pulling it's bad, there's something wrong with you, you can't stop, this is a weird habit, you're so weak, nobody can love or accept you the way you are. This is actually something that, you know, we tell ourselves or this critical voice in our head tells us and then, you know, it makes us feel ashamed, guilty, frustrated or helpless, almost 
you know, like we have this other part in ourselves, this what we call vulnerable child that is, you know, facing this bully, this inner bully that we have, this critical voice, and just feeling helpless and small and not enough. But the fact that sometimes we feel like that when we talk to ourselves this way doesn't mean that we have to accept it or that we cannot draw boundaries um, in front of this inner critical voice. And obviously this conflict that we have inside ourselves, all of us is a huge topic and we cannot get into all of the details, but sharing plays an important role here. Okay, bear with me. If I agree to this inner critical voice and say, right, you're right. This part of me, nobody can know. I cannot share it. I cannot share it with anyone, even the ones that I trust um, the most. Then the message that you're sending to yourself, to your own vulnerable child is, there are parts of me that no one is going to love or accept. I have to hide those parts. And you're perpetuating this way of talking down to yourself and feeling bad about yourself. However, if you are courageous enough, if, you're, um, if you decide to share it, uh, even just a little bit, then what you're messaging to yourself and your inner child is, this is nothing to be ashamed about. You are just as important and worthy as anyone else. This is a medical condition. It's not your fault. If any other person would distance themselves from you or shame you for your hair pulling, it's better you draw clear boundaries because you deserve to be loved and supported. That's the message that you send to yourself if you are brave enough um, to share your experience, which again, I know is, is very, very difficult, but you know, there's inner processes that are going on in the way you behave on the outside, the way you talk about yourself or don't talk about yourself has an influence on how you feel inside. And that's um, the main reason why I think sharing is so important, but obviously um, we know there's many, many benefits um, on top of that, if we decide to share, then we're contributing to destigmatization. De There's a lot of stigma and misconceptions around hair pulling. And as long as we don't talk about it, those um, stigmata are going to just stick around. Um, if you don't open up, you cannot get support, you know, and it's important. It's, dif it's a difficult uh, condition to deal with. So you deserve to be supported. Um, it gives an opportunity for connection because as long as we hide parts of ourselves, no matter if it's hair pulling or something else that we're ashamed of, as long as we hide things we feel vulnerable about, um, we're never going to be completely and 100% connected to another person. And lastly, you know, it's a sign of trust if you tell someone else that and they will notice that and they will most likely feel re receive it as a compliment. Um, yeah, so we all have this vulnerable child, this vulnerable part in ourselves. And just as you see in this um, beautiful installation from the Burning Man, um, real connection comes from sharing this vulnerable part of ourselves. But obviously, um, there's a lot of things to consider. You don't want to share this with everyone and you maybe don't want to share everything so before you decide to let someone in on your experience um, it's important to be very clear um, and anchored when it comes to your boundaries and again I want um, before we go through this these five steps of how to set boundaries when sharing um, I want you to you know keep your own life in mind think about whether there is anyone in your life that you would um, consider sharing this part about yourself with and then go through those steps um, having this in mind. So when you think about your boundaries, first of all, one boundary is who do I share with and who do I not share with? So obviously you wanna share with, only with people that you, that you trust, that you feel comfortable with. And sometimes it's even hard to, to, to share with those, right? And then if you feel like that's a step too far for you, then you can consider sharing with a therapist in a support group. Um, and if that's not too much, then you could even share, you know, on an online forum um, anonymously, you know, whatever first step seems possible to you, as long as it's a step in the right direction, that's great. You know, you can take it slow. 
And then you obviously also want to think about what to share. You may, maybe you only want to just say, you know, I, I have this condition that I suffer from, or maybe you want to go into more detail, share a little bit about how it makes you feel about your struggle. Um, and why you do that, you want to stay anchored and, and, you know, keep your boundaries in mind. Sometimes it's very important to, to be clear about that before, because sometimes when you're in the actual conversation, you know, you, you're being put on the spot, you're being asked questions that you didn't expect. So as the more you're anchored in terms of what's okay for you and what you feel comfortable with and whatnot, the easier it's going to be for you to um, react in the situation. Um, you want to share casually. And what I mean by that is don't talk about it like it's this giant secret or something that you're burdening other people with by telling them. Just talk about it like it's a me medical condition, like you're sharing suffering from diabetes or asthma or something like that. You deserve an empathetic and non-judgmental reaction. And if not, you should rethink you know, your relationship to the person that you're talking to. And finally, be prepared. Think about the person you want to share with. Think about the reactions that you might get. It, you know, the hair pulling is nothing to be embarrassed about, but you also cannot expect anyone to immediately understand, to immediately, you know, react exactly in the way that you would want them to, to ask the right questions. So think about what's realistic to expect. Think about what you expect from yourself, because that's the only thing that's in your control. And if you are really scared, then you know, create yourself a safety net, um, schedule a date with a person you like afterwards, think about, take your dog out for a walk, whatever will make you feel better afterwards if this is a difficult thing for you to do. Um, and just as a little um, encouragement, if you are considering, you know, sharing about your experience with a person that you haven't shared with before. Um, I found this um, question in a Reddit group. Um, this is actually about skin picking, which is another form of body focused repetitive behaviors, but it's it, there is a lot of similarities. So there um, was this one person posting a question saying, you know, I'm in this new relationship and I'm really hesitant to share um, about my skin picking with my partner. What do you think? What are your experiences? And then, you know, the answers were, there were so many beautiful answers of people, you know, describing um, how they shared their experience with their partner and they, uh, what happened. And I just copy pasted two of those reactions here. I'm going to read them to you. First one, um, my partner asked me once early in the relationship about the open wounds on my face that I had after a horrible episode of picking. I told him honestly what was going on. It has been nothing but kind and loving. He will very gently ask me occasionally how I'm doing if he notices the picking is worse and celebrate with me when it's better. I had never once, he had never once looked like or said anything to make me feel like my scars were turned off for him. I know he's sad to see my pain, but he has always been super sweet about it. Yeah, so when I talk about expectations, sometimes, you know, we get a more positive um, reaction than we actually expected. And the second one, your partner is going to have something they perceive as a major flaw that you think nothing negative of as well. For instance, my husband is so insecure about his teeth and I'm so insecure about my picking. Neither of us ever think negatively about the others and definitely never mention it. And when I think about how I feel about his teeth, I just think, oh, this must be how he feels about my picking. Indifferent, maybe concerned and mostly loving. Um, and this is exactly, you know, what, again, <laughs> this uh, installation that I love <laughs> from the, um, burning Man signifies for me, when you open up about your vulnerabilities, you're giving your partner or friend or family the opportunity to open up as well. And then you can find real connection um, and that can be their healing. And that's why I think sharing is important. Yes. Um, and now we're gonna move on to the second group. Adults that have a loved adult loved one who is also an adult who suffers from hair pulling. Um, 
And we're going to talk about how to talk about it. We're going to talk about how you can help and how to set boundaries as a person who supports someone who suffers from hair pulling. Um, so if you have a suspicion or know someone that you care for who suffers from hair pulling and you haven't talked to them yet and you're hesitant because you don't know how to talk about it, then uh, my first advice to you would be to inf to learn about it. To learn about hair pulling, there are a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths um, out there and what you know, what you think um, might not be true. So first of all, try to learn about it. Um, actually, um, on our YouTube page, trickstuff.com, we have a lot of webinars with a lot of information about hair pulling that you could use as a source of learning. We also have a blog on our website. Um, we have a forum, but there's also a lot of online forums on Facebook and other places where people share their experience. Um, I'm also part of some of those forums just to understand the experience of people suffering from hair pulling better. And... Those are great you know, places where you can learn about it. We actually had um, a webinar for those of you who missed it, I think last month or the month before about um, myths, facts and myths um, uh, in, tri tri in trichotillomania. Um, and here's just you know some of the takeaways, um, but you're more than invited to look, to, to check that webinar out as well. So some of the um, facts and myths, hair pulling is not a bad habit. It's a medical condition. You cannot just stop. Hair pulling is not a form of self-harm. Hair pulling can occur in all areas of the body and break out at any age. It is not a rare condition. Prevalence is actually similar or even higher than OCD. Um, and it can be hard to live with, to cope with, but it's treatable. For example, if you do habit reversal training, um, the kind of therapy treatment that we use at TrickStop, um, then you can definitely improve. Yeah, so first of all, inform yourself, be knowledgeable. And then when you actually have the conversation with this person that you know that suffers from um, hair pulling, then talk in a validating way. And I don't know about you, but I see, you know, the word or the idea of validation a lot on social media. Um, there's actually, a, it's actually a therapeutic concept um, and there are guidelines on how to do it. Um, and I want to show them to you. Basically, the definition of a validating way of communication is a way of listening and talking that makes the other person feel like their feelings, experiences, or perspectives are valid and make sense. Um, so the opposite of making them feel ashamed, alone, or is if they were exaggerating. Basically, it's a big old, I can understand why you feel the way you feel or why your experience is your experience. And not only as a therapist, but um, as a person, I really like want to encourage you to pay attention to those rules. They are so helpful when you listen to someone who's going through a hard time. Um, not only people who suffer from hair pulling, um, it's such a nice way to feel, make the other person feel, you know, understood and seen. So what you want to do, and I'm going to um, explain you, to you the, those um, kind of guidelines based on an example. Um, let's say, you know, your loved one comes home from work and says, I'm so frustrated. My day was fine. Work was fine. All is fine. But when I went to the bathroom after lunch, I pulled my hair again. I just couldn't stop it. So the first thing, um, you want to do is listen and you can show that you're listening by, um, giving nonverbal signs such as, um, nodding, creating eye contact, putting your phone away turning towards the person, you know, doing everything that shows them I'm with you, 100% concentrated to tell me more. And then you can also um, show that you're listening by paraphrasing, basically saying the same thing again, but in your own words to show I'm listening and I'm trying to understand you. Um, so in this case, this, this could look like I can see how frustrated you are. Everything seemed fine, your day, your work, but then it still happens, although you don't want to. There's a little bit of new information, you know, I'm I'm kind of giving your emotion that you're not, that you didn't talk about how you feel, but I could see how you feel. I'm giving it a name, I'm calling it out. I, I think you're frustrated. But other than that, um, just basically repeating what you just told me. 
And then you can also show that you're listening by asking questions, non-judgmental questions, inquisitory, just, just to get more information. Um, what happened um, at lunch or, or how did you deal with it afterwards? You know, how did you cope with the situation? And um, once the other person understands that you're completely there and listening and paying attention, you can start validating. And the first um, and maybe simplest form of validation is just validating the feeling. I can understand that you feel frustrated. If I was working so hard and trying to cope with a condition like you're pulling, I would also be upset when it happens again. So the best way to validate a feeling is saying, if I was in your situation, I would feel the same way. It makes so much sense. We're making sense out of your feeling. If I was going through the same thing, I would feel exactly the same way. Or if that doesn't seem authentic to you, you can say something like, wow, I think so many people in your position would ex ex feel exactly the same way. Just make them feel less alone with what they're going through. Then you can validate based on um, the other person's past or um, condition. In that, in in this case, the um, medical condition would be hair pulling. When you have hair pulling disorder, it is normal that you sometimes pull without noticing or that you have a hard time stopping yourself. Now, I know you know you suffer from this condition, and based on that um, fact, I I completely understand why you had a hard time. Or when you were small, you used to pull in the bathroom to hide it from your parents. Of course, now the bathroom is kind of a trigger for you. I know you, I know your past, you know, I know why this is hard for you and it makes complete sense to me. Again, it makes sense. Um, and some of you might think, well, okay, but if I like only ever validate everything, will that not stop the person I'm caring for from changing? And I have to say, absolutely not. The fact that someone else understands why something's hard for you is not going to stop you from wanting to change because <laughs> it is hard. So obviously you want to change. Um, and also you can even um, use validation as um, a strategy to create motivation. But first of all, I forgot one more. So you can also validate based on the situation. Again, the past, the condition or the situation. So an example for that would be you're saying everything is fine, but I know you are still new at this company and trying so hard to show your best side all the time. It makes sense that when you are uninterrupted and alone that you would pull to quickly relieve some of the stress. So again, I know I understand the situation you were in. In light of the situation, it makes so much sense what happened. And now one step further, validate and motivate validate and give perspective of change. I can understand how frustrating it must be to try so hard to change and to then catch yourself pulling again. It's because I see how much this weighs on you that, and then whatever, you know, change you want to um, kind of help them to go towards. Like, it's because of that, that um, I want to help you, that I'm giving you this fidget, that I want you to encourage to try out therapy or have it reversal training. I see your pain and I want to encourage you um, to do something about it. All right. And because I think those strategies of validation are so important, I want to repeat them with you with another example. So let's say our um, loved one is saying, I don't want to go to the party. Everyone will see the spot on my head where I pulled. Um, Go through those strategies on your own for a second. Try to think, okay, how can I paraphrase that? How can I say the same thing again in different words? You could say, I see that you're really anxious about what people will think at this party, so much so that you don't want to go at all. Now, think about how you can just validate the feeling that the person is experiencing. I can totally understand that. I would be nervous too. Very simple. If I was in your situation, I would feel the same way. Validate based on the past.
I know that in the past people have asked about your hair or about a bald spot. It makes so much sense that you would be nervous. Validation based on the medical condition that is here pulling. You know, many people suffering from hair pulling are anxious in social situations. You're not alone. It's something that a lot of people that go through the same thing experience. And finally, validate and motivate at the same time. What could you say? Because I see how hard this is for you, I think you're so brave for thinking about going anyways. If you do decide to go, I think you will be really proud of yourself afterwards. All right. So those are strategies of validation. Let's move on to how to help. So um, if you want to help and might maybe even just like, let's call it support and not help, then um, first of all, ask ask questions for a lot of people who suffer from hair pulling. It's hard to open up the conversation themselves as we discussed in when we talked about sharing. So sometimes being asked about it is easier. And if you don't ask, it might make them feel like it's, you know, this topic that you're talking around, that you're tiptoeing around, <laughs> sorry, that you're hesitant about. And that might even increase um, emotions of embarrassment and shame. Um, be non-judgmental. Just treat it like it's another medical condition, just as I said, like an allergy, asthma. Um, and don't think it's anyone's fault. And um, if you want to support and encourage them, then, you know, ask. Ask um, how you can help because everyone wants to be supported differently. Um, maybe your loved one wants, you know, you to show interest to listen. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. Maybe they want help when they feel ashamed or frustrated. Maybe they do want to have some practical help, like you handing them a fidget or telling them um, when they're not aware of their pulling. But it depends on, you know, what the person you care for needs and wants. And that's different for everyone. But generally, you know, if it comes to helping and supporting, there have to be clear boundaries. Um, it's not easy if you have a loved one who is going through anything, any any medical or mental condition, it doesn't mean, it matter if it's, you know, hair pulling or skin picking or depression or an anxiety disorder. Um, it's always difficult. If, if you really are close to that person, it's going to be difficult for you as well. And so if you see, you know, your loved one and the hair pulling disorder, you know, those two things, then a lot of people um, kind of want to jump in the middle because it's so hard to deal with the hair pulling. They just want to help. They just want to take the pain away. But that is not a good idea. Um, if you try to kind of stand between your loved one and the hair pulling, if you just want to, you know, treat it for them, then um, you're setting yourself up for failure. First of all, it's not going to work. It will negatively impact, impact your relationship with them. And more, most importantly, you're taking away their chance to learn how to cope with it. And that's very, very important also for parents who obviously have a very natural instinct of just jumping in the middle of it, but, but don't. So what you wanna do is you wanna stand beside that person. You wanna um, have their back. You know, it's not, it's not that you're not in the picture, but you're not in the middle. You don't treat them. You don't manage their emotions for them. Things like if I make her angry, she will pull. Don't don't think those thoughts. Just be, just behave exactly the way you would. Don't walk on eggshells. Don't take responsibility um, if they pull. Um, and you know, take care of yourself first. Just as we always say, you know, in in the airplane, plane, you put yourself the oxygen mask on first, and then you can take care of another person or be there for another person. And Whatever your oxygen mask is, you know, if it's going on a date with a friend, with another friend, whether it's, you know, having a hobby, with, whether it's 
um, going seeking therapy yourself or going to a support group of supporting people, um, whatever it is, it's important. If you know the person you love is going through something, you're going through something as well. Okay, and the parents, the parents. Um, so first of all, a lot of parents who um, seek help for their child who is suffering from hair pulling have this question weighing on them of, is it my fault? Did I do that? Is there something about me as a parent that makes my child pull their hair? That's actually the question that a lot of parents ask themselves, no matter whether their child is suffering from hair pulling or anxiety or whatever it is. And um, my answer is always very clearly, it's not your fault, not your child's fault either. Um, hair pulling is such a complicated, if you think about the why hair pulling kind of like the disorder breaks out, there's such a multifaceted, complicated um, number of reasons that cause it. Um, and that can range from problems with um, self-regulation or intense emotions to um, genetic predispositions, um, neural changes, temperament, age of onset, um, co-occurring disorders, environmental stressors, life experiences, it's so many things at once, just like um, most disorders. Um, so this is really not a good question to ask. It also doesn't help anyone. So think about it less in the sense of your fault and more in the sense of your responsibility. This is your child, so it's your responsibility to help them cope. Um, and the two most important things that you're gonna do is be nurturing and responding to their needs and you're gonna help them regulate their emotions. And in the short time that we have left, I'm gonna share my thoughts on those topics with you. So first of all, um, again, the, how to talk about it, but this one is child edition. So obviously um, the validating strategies go for children as well, but then also children have specific questions when they um, are hair pulling that it's your job as the parent to answer for them. Even if they don't answer, even though if they don't ask those questions out loud, they are very likely to have those questions. The first one, what's wrong with me? Why am I pulling my hair and why can I not stop? Um, so your child doesn't know what's going on and you have to explain it to them. You have to explain to them that they're suffering from a medical condition through no fault of their own and you have to normalize it. This is not something weird that's only going on with you. Did you know that many other children and adults have the same problem? You can even try to translate, you know, statistical numbers in a way that your child would understand. You know how you have about 100 kids in your year? in your class, in your kindergarten. Think about the fact that what that 60 of them probably pulled their hair, picked their skin, or bit their nails at some point, you know, in the past. And think about the fact that four of them are likely in the same situation as you, where they cannot stop. They're not alone with this, right? We know those things from research. Or normalize um, by putting yourself in the equation. You know how I have, you know, need classes because I have this um, eye condition and, you know, the same way you need therapy because you have this um, other condition with your hair. Nothing special about it, but I'm here to help. Then the second question, why do I pull? And now here, the same for you, you have to be informed. You have to know about the disorder. You have to know about the cycle of the pulling trigger, urge, pulling, and then the consequential emotions and explain it to them. You know, you know how sometimes before you pull, you have this feeling inside of yourself. Where do you feel it? Do you feel it, you know, in the spot where you want to pull? That's called an urge. And that always comes before the pulling. And that's why it's so hard to not do it because the urge is really hard. You just, you know, want to resolve this urge. Explain it to them and um, help them to be more self-aware. <clears throat> and third question, obviously, okay, wait, so I have this thing. Will you judge me for it? Has anything changed? 
you see me um, differently now. And then it's very important to you, it's very important to show your child nothing has changed. You're loved unconditionally, no matter what's going on. Um, a lot of children even, you know, deny it or hide it. Um, so be patient, you know, don't push them. Maybe even tell them about how you at some point had, you know, a secret that you felt you couldn't share with anyone and how it made you feel and what helped you to, you know, open up in the end. Yeah, just be very patient and just show your child that you're there for them no matter what. And finally, because, you know, parents spend a lot of time with their kids and so they obviously are going to be around when the pulling actually happens. And then it's really hard to decide what am I going to do with this? I want to give you some tips. First of all, what you don't want to do is tell them to stop. That way you're just setting them up for failure. It's just like telling your child to not sneeze when they have to. Don't force them to seek professional help. Don't shame or embarrass them for the pulling and don't punish or scold. No negative reactions. It's better to not react at all. Um, so what you actually wanna do is first of all, self-regulate. To see your child pulling when you know this is a problem is difficult and stressful. So first of all, you have to stay calm. If you are not calm, you cannot be there for them. So take a deep breath, remind yourself, your child will be okay. You're going to be okay. This is no one's fault. And if that is not enough, then think about how you can self-regulate and think about what you need because you're the anchor. You're not anchored, then, um, you know, you and your child are just flo floating around in a sea or in a storm. And then you don't immediately have to actually do something. First of all, you can observe. Try to understand what's going on with your child for them. See if you can identify triggers, certain emotions or situations that make the pulling occur. Um, try to understand whether they are aware of what's going on, um, how much it happens, where it happens. Just understand it first. And then once you do, you can start um, by creating awareness together with your child um, and create creating awareness means for your child to notice what's going on and to specifically also notice when the urge comes up and you can do that by um, for example making a game out of it so for one hour a day you're playing the urge game and um, if your child notices an urge before they pull no matter if they pull in the end or not that's not the goal it's just no the goal is not noticing the urge then they get a star or you put a marble into a jar and if you notice the pulling without the child identifying the urge first then you you know get a star or a marble in a glass and the goal is eventually for your child to beat you or you can, if you are creative or your child is creative, you can draw the urge or the pulling and just call it the urge monster or the pulling monster, just also to take away, you know, the guilt. Just it's not you, it's just this monster that's, that comes and tickles you and annoys you until you pull. And it's really hard to deal with, but we can, you know, beat the monster together. Um, and then... You know, when you have this awareness and cooperation, then you can start by offering, you know, alternative behaviors, fidgets and barriers once the urge is there or the pulling occurs. If your child is really stressed or exhausted, then encourage them to take a break. Um, but in the end, I mean, you want to seek professional help because in most cases, um, when we talk about trichotillomania, it's not just gonna go away and you're not a therapist. So there is there are, again are boundaries to what you can do. But I hope that those you know tips help you a little bit. And also um one thing not directly relating to the hair pulling itself, but um since a lot of hair pulling um occurs when there are strong, big emotions present, what you can also do is help your child to just deal with the negative emotions that trigger the hair pulling. And here are some quick um, tips that I can give you without, you know, actually making this a therapy session. Um, so first of all, if you're, if it's a really big emotion, and if your child is really unsettled or upset, 
then you can use a crowning strategy, the same one that I advise for adults to use. You take your child aside, you know, into a calm environment and tell them, okay, wait, let's take a few breaths. Tell me five things you can see. And then tell me four things you can feel. And once they tell you four things they can feel, tell me three things you can hear, two things that you can smell, one thing that you can taste. You can even do it with them. And once they connect to their senses, you're just going to be a little bit more grounded and a little bit more present. And then you can go on to the next step. The next step would be to understand what's going on. What is this? What are you feeling? That's not so easy for us adults and definitely not easy for children. You can have, you know, some visual help. This again can be a creative project for you and your child if you are creative. Um, I am not, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so you can, you know, create a wheel like that. So if they're really upset, they can just show you the way they feel. If they don't want to talk about it. Um, and once you know how they feel, you can help them to deal and um, to cope. And there are, you know, small strategies that you can do just in this little graph that I copy pasted here, like, you know, doing jumping jacks, taking deep breaths, counting to 20, doing some stretches, drinking some water all kinds of like small things that can, can help regulate an emotion. But the main and most important thing that I always tell parents is you, you have to be a model. You, you have to be, your children will imitate you if it comes to emotion regulation. The way you deal with your emotions is going to influence their emotion regulation skills the most. Um, sometimes we forget we, we, because we're we, we humans live so much in our heads and we so much so many things are conveyed through language that um, we forget how much we actually convey without um language and so much more important that what than what you we tell our children is what is how we live and what we demonstrate to them um so you know, you can, you can share with your children. You can, first of all, you know, show them how you deal with emotions, but you can even say, you know, wow, um, at work, I was so stressed and anxious because I had this um, conversation with my boss. And, you know, I felt the um, fear wave washing over me. It was so difficult. I just wanted to run away home. I didn't want to do it anymore. But then I said, no, I'm not going to let anxiety take over. It's important to me. And I took a few breaths and I called your mom. She calmed me down a little bit. And then I went into the conversation with my boss and it went okay. And afterwards, I was so proud of myself. You know, you can tell them like this, but also when you're when you are experiencing an emotion with your child, you can just share it with them. Wow, you know what you just said made me really anxious, uh, made me really mad. So um, I'm just gonna go to another room because um, I have to calm down for a minute, and I don't want to yell at you. You know, just let them in on how you do it, and then they will learn by example. <clears throat> All right, that's it for now. Um, for today, let's conclude. So sharing your experience, if you are suffering from hair pulling with trusted people's healing, um, you're basically showing your inner child that there is nothing to hide. But before you decide to open up to someone else, just be very, very clear where your boundaries are, because only if you have clear boundaries, you are in control of your narrative. If you are a partner, friend, or family to a person suffering from hair pulling, um, then it's very important to be informed, to use the validation strategies that I showed you, to um, ask how, you know, your loved ones want to be supported and to keep your own boundaries while you do that. And if you're a parent, remember, it's nobody's fault. As long as you show your child that they are loved unconditionally, you're doing the most important thing. By the way, just the fact that you're here in this webinar already means so much. 50% of parents of children who hair pull don't even know about the disorder. So the fact that you're here means that you know about it and you're trying to do something about it. So great job already. Um, answer the questions that they have and might or might not ask openly and help them cope with difficult emotions. All right. Um, just as the last thing, let me mention our free resources. So as you can see, because you're participating in one, we have monthly 
free webinars that you're always invited to. We have online forums and blogs on our website, um, trickstop.com. Actually, one on online forum and one blog <laughs> on our website, um, trickstop.com. And we have Facebook groups. We're present on Instagram and TikTok. Please check those options out. And if you want to um, join the online therapy program, Trick Stop, then um, we have a $100 discount code for your first um, subscription. All right. So just again, uh, I want to mention, I saw that people are raising their hands. Please, if you have a question, write it down in the Q&A section. Um, we have... A little about 15 minutes left. Let's see. So far, we have two questions. Definitely possible to answer two questions in 15 minutes. Okay, first one. I have a particular issue concerning my problem. I know that chocolate and caffeine are the major culprit, but I cannot give them up. I went to half caffeine, but I do love chocolate and I do use the spray color to cover up spots and I am less self-conscious. Um, not sure what the question is. You mean that chocolate and caffeine are um, triggers? Maybe you can just Write, write a follow-up question or information in the Q&A section. Just going to go to the second question in the meanwhile. My daughter is nine and we first noticed trichotillomania symptoms at the beginning of this year and the hair pulling locations have spread. Um, what assistance can I expect from utilizing the paid portion of the app? Um, <clears throat> so... Um, if you sign up to um, for um, service, by, by the way, it's not an app. It's like a, an online platform form that you can access to your um, phone or through your desktop. And so what we're going to do is we're going to explain to you as parents um, how to deal with the hair pulling. And we're going to walk you through the gold standard um, treatment of hair pulling, which is habit reversal training. And then you are basically going to help your child deal with it based on what you learned in the program. And it's therapist assisted. So you're going to have um, a therapist at your side that is um, that you um, can communicate with via chat um, every day. And they are also going to guide you through how to help your child using the program. Okay, how to, okay, now the, the first question she, she actually um, specified. So the chocolate and the caffeine are triggers. Well, I should say I'm not... Um, an addiction um, specialist. Obviously, chocolate and caffeine are not really. I mean, it's not really an addiction, like an alcohol addiction. But like, it's, it's giving up um, chocolate and caffeine is not the same way as the same thing as um, treating a BFRB. Um, I do know though that um, a really good strategy to better deal with. Um, giving up habits such as chocolate and caffeine is um, mindfulness. Um, creating mindfulness for the process for when the um, urge to eat chocolate or um, I guess smoke a cigarette, no, caffeine, not, so, sorry, tobacco, caffeine um, or drink coffee or whatever it is. Um, so be, be mindful about it. So I think one advice that I could give you is um, practice mindfulness and also maybe look up using mindfulness to um, give up habits or to um, fight addiction. That would be one, but I, I do have to say I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. I haven't had a client so far that I helped them give up chocolate or caffeine. Also, that's an interesting, I've not, I also never experienced this as a trigger. Why does the, why does the chocolate and caffeine make you pull? Is it because you feel 
guilty afterwards and then you're basically um regulating the emotions through the pulling because then you know what you really want to do is is deal with the feelings of guilt and not with the chocolate or the caffeine itself Thank you for everything, Sophia. I live in Berlin for the past two and a half years, and I would like to find a therapist or support here. The problem is I don't speak German. That is so interesting. That's just a fun fact. I am German, but I don't live in Germany. Um, so I'm I'm sure you can find um, an English-speaking therapist in Berlin if you need one. Um, it's such an international city. Um, it depends on whether you have a German health insurance because then you actually get therapy for free there as well. And if you don't, then I really want to encourage you to try out um, TrickStop. Um, all of our therapists are international. They speak English. It's If you don't get the free German healthcare version of therapy, then TrickStop is very affordable. It's more affordable than paying for therapy yourself. So... I want to, yeah, obviously I want to encourage you to try out our program. Um, I started pulling in my sleep. Why and how do I stop? Well, that's a difficult question. Mm. First of all, if you're pulling in your sleep, I would try out barriers, things that stop you, like like wearing a hat or something on your hands where you cannot pick. And then why um, I would try to, and that's really a question that I would try to analyze with a therapist. Like what has changed in your life? How is your pulling during the day since you started at night? What are the nights where you do it most? During which time at night? Um, is it on specific days where you were stressed or, um, yeah, so in terms of like, how do I stop, maybe try barriers first and then try to understand, you know, what changed in your life now that you, um, pick at night or what kind of led to it and then try to work on that as well. Um, Okay, I, I, another question, an, another in, um, information um, from the person um, in that, that asked about the caffeine and the chocolate. So they are both stimulants. It's not about the feelings of shame. It's more that the stimulation through the chocolate and the caffeine. And then with chocolate, it happens within six minutes. Um, So basically what I advise you to do is, um, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on how to give up um, coffee and chocolate, but uh, I would just try um, habit for reversal training, you know, eat the chocolate and then um, identify the urge and try um, a replacement um, behavior, just, just like you would... Um, yeah, if your trigger was a negative emotion or if your trigger was boredom or whatever it is. Just this is a trigger that I haven't heard about before, but you know, one way is to just eliminate triggers, but you can never eliminate all the triggers. So you can also um, work on, you know, replacement behaviors and use habit reversal training. Um, okay, how much time do we have? Yep, we still have some time left. So follow up question for the from the person. In Germany, um, they you weren't able to find a therapist in Berlin that speaks English, um, but you do have insurance. Hmm. Not an expert in how to find therapists in Germany, to be honest, because I don't live there. Don't know anyone in Berlin. I, I really would just try to, you know, just ask as many people as as you possibly can if they can help you with it. You don't have to, you know, tell them that you're suffering from hair pulling. Um, wow, there's also this research group, but I don't know where they are. There's a German research group. 
that does a lot of beautiful research um in the FRBs. No, but they're not in Berlin. Um maybe if you find online forums for people suffering from hair pulling, um then um you could ask there. But yeah, you just have to find a way to access more people in Berlin. I'm sure like I, there is no way I can imagine that there's not an English speaking therapist in Berlin that could you could treat you. Yeah, if none of this advice helped, then please um, write an email to our support um, email address, and I will think about it further and think whether there's anything else I can do for you. But now on the spot, I cannot think about any, anything else, but I'm sure there is a therapist. And if you have German health insurance, then you're going to get the therapy for free. Oh, okay. I will join the program. Well, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> do it. I'm sure you're not going to regret it. Um, Okay. I have tried so many different types of treatments over the last several years. Trick stop, habit reversal, CBT, DBT, ACT, mindfulness, mindfulness, meditation, several medications.